I'd like to thank the organizers and uh, the Slave Tooth Nation for hosting the event and for giving me the opportunity to speak too loudly and close to the mic, but uh, to speak nonetheless. Um, today, I'd like to talk about briefly what climate change means for the Salish Sea and more in depth what this means for us and what we can do about it. Climate change creates a lot of different biophysical chemical changes. But these different changes will affect ecosystem services and landscapes that we care about and that we derive direct value from and that are on their own innately valuable. And I'd like to discuss how estuaries and coastlines um, will be affected and what we may do to help improve um, the state of these uh, important ecosystems going forward. So the focus here, coastlines and estuaries, uh, I'll briefly talk about what changes we can expect by talking about regional um, sea level rise, then about what changes we can expect um, as, this might, as this is influenced by coastal development. Um, I'll talk about how we may be impacted uh, using a case study on changing um, distributions and fish catch volumes. Um, think about how we can measure this change and propose some um, preliminary solutions for how we might be able to adapt. When we think about climate change, sea level rise is one of these big questions that, um, that captures a lot of media attention. Sea level rise is going up by 20 centimeters, by 50 centimeters, by a meter. There's different projections under different scenarios. But what does this mean? If uh, we're going to have a sea level rise of 40 centimeters versus 35, you know, we can look up to, maybe it's up to our knee, but you know, what, what does that really mean? Well, first, we have to take, up, um, take into account how much sea level will rise relative to the land in a given location. So if we have a sea level rise of one meter globally, that's not going to be one meter everywhere, because some, in some regions, the land is moving up. In other regions, the land is moving down, as, the, for example, the, the uh, weight that was released at the end of the last ice age. Um, uh, since that's dissipated, the land is now moving up in some areas, um, in the Arctic, uh, for example. So here we can see around the Salish Sea, um, and then with the small numbers, um, but they're different regional um, estimates for how much sea level will rise relative to the land. So we can see up in the north in Campbell River, um, we're looking at around 21 centimeters of sea level rise, but really anywhere between 4 to 46 centimeters. Further south, in around the Vancouver Lower Mainland area, we're looking at about 50 centimeters with a range of maybe 28 to 77, or let's say between 30 to 80. Um, it's about the same down in um, Puget Sound um, and just a, sli a little bit less um, around the Sandwich Peninsula. This is because of different differences in what's called isostatic rebound when the land adjusts um, after the weight of glaciers is gone. So sea level rise varies by region, but wave impacts present the greatest risk. If sea level is 50 centimeters higher, you don't just look around and see how many things will be flooded at every high tide with 50 more centimeters. We have to think about how wave impacts will change. So when water depth the near shore is deeper, the size and power of waves increases, and the distance, the closer to uh, coastal infrastructure, um, uh, they will break. So it pushes waves up uh, further onto the land. Um, but a, a real key feature that influences this is sediment transport. So sediment transport um, is the types of sand and silt and mud that erode and get moved along the coast. And so we've got sea levels going up, we've got waves attacking the shore, and we also have erosion and sediment moving around. And now when sediment gets eroded from one place, it doesn't disappear. It moves along the coast and settles somewhere else. And these natural cycles help maintain the beaches that um, protect us from wave impacts. So as we develop a coast, and the Salish Sea is a very, very developed coast, we have to be aware of how the types of structures we're building affect the way sediment moves into the water and how this affects erosion and in turn exposes us to bigger wave impacts, but how this erosion and the changes in erosion patterns also affect key habitats for salmon and for the forage fish that depend on them. Uh, with climate change, in addition to sea level rise, we have rising water temperature. This increased temperature is creating a northward shift in the distributions of species. So we're going to see a lot more um, species that are common in the California current ecosystem around California, Oregon, and Washington, moving up into British Columbia, which is a transition zone between that California current ecosystem and the Alaskan current. So we'll have, for example, 
perhaps less salmon, but more um, Pacific sardine. This increase in uh, temperature also applies to rivers and has a key impact on the health of salmon. Um, salmon, as they move up rivers on their way to spawn, um, accumulate heat stress, and when they have enough degree days, which is enough units of temperature, they have different parasites that express themselves and kill the salmon, uh, reducing their ability to spawn. Salmon also don't enter streams until the temperature reaches a certain threshold. Anywhere below about 15 degrees, they'll go in. If it's higher, they'll wait. And as they wait at the mouths of the river, they get stressed. So we're not only having sea level rise, wave impacts, and changes in sediment transport that affect the habitats of salmon and their prey, we're also having temperature changes that push the distribution further north and stress them in the important or critical uh, phases of the life cycle as they migrate upstream to spawn. So here's um, an example of what happens uh, when we have coastal erosion, these physical coastal processes of, of sediment transport. So here we've got this blue, dark blue line. Let's imagine that is a bluff. So we have our high water in 2018. It's at the toe of the bluff and it causes erosion, steadily pulling sediment in and moving it down what's called a drift cell and depositing it, depositing it on a beach uh, further down uh, the current. As the water level goes up, the wave attack on that shoreline changes, the bluff erodes more, it falls into the water and um, accelerates that sediment contribution. Um, as long as there's no development on the bluff and it can keep moving back, the habitat will adapt. This near shore um, and intertidal zone will maintain the ecosystem and habitat functions that are important uh, to supporting fish. But when we build seawalls to stop that from happening, those processes um, get upset. And the reason we stop that is because of things like this. When we think of coastal erosion, we often don't see it as a natural and necessary uh, physical process that helps maintain coastal ecosystems. We see it as a threat to what we've built there. This is an example from California where people built uh, homes on property next to cliffs. It's zoned as residential, so people look at this rectangle on a map and go, great, that's my property. And don't think about in 10, 20, 50, 100 years how it's in this natural feeder bluff that's going to erode and we get faced with a problem where we have to either move our homes um, or we have to build defenses. And often what we do is build defenses. This has these downstream um, impacts in the drift cell as there's less sediment in the water. So what happens is forage fish and juvenile habitat um, is affected. This is um, an example of a barrier beach. Uh, again, the dark blue is 2018. We've got a high water, uh, this kind of this balance between driftwood, vegetation, and intertidal spawning habitat. If we have natural erosion down the drift cell, water level goes up, doesn't really matter because it's pulling in more sediment and it's allowing this barrier beach to move up and back and maintain the values that maintain the ecosystem services and ecosystem functions that we need. But when we start to build these hard structures in the shoreline, it of course interrupts us. Um, this affects not just um, these barrier beaches, it also affects estuaries as we um, build more development along the rivers that feed into estuaries. There's less ground, uh, less vegetative cover. The water takes more solar gain, gets hotter, tougher for salmon, um, less food as well. And as we have outside of these estuaries, more salmon waiting to go in till the water temperature decreases, we have increased predation um, by seals. And um, some recent research is looking into whether or not that's significant uh, in terms of affecting um, salmon reaching the spawning grounds. But nonetheless, it changes the dynamics um, of the ecosystem. And so here we have just another um, graphical example of what happens when we build a seawall. We've got high water in 2018, high water in tw uh, 2100. And now that there's a wall, the shoreline's got nowhere to go. So we've got this kind of speckled area. That's where the waves turn over, they scour the sand off the rocks, they take away the types of substrate where forage fish can lay their eggs, and the forage fish um, have to go somewhere else. So what impact does this have on us? How can these different climate changes translate into direct impacts on people, and how can they translate into direct impacts on um, First Nations' rights to access um, and make use of uh, their territories? So I'll just present this in a brief um, case study on food sovereignty uh, in the context of 
climate change affecting the distribution of species, the habitat and harvesting sites, and the measurable impact it can have on wild foods and associated activity. So food sovereignty is different from food security. Uh, refers to the right and the ability um, for people to access, control, and produce what's needed for a healthy and culturally and socially relevant diet. In the case of um, this example study with the Namgis First Nation, um, a community survey was undertaken and uh, by looking at what people ate historically and what people would like to eat today. Per person, a sample traditional diet could include 24 sockeye per year, 30 crabs, 15 bags of clams, about 80 kilos of berries and fruit, 12 waterfowl, 16 kilos of elk, and 60 kilos of seaweeds before drying. So that's what people want to eat. That's what people ate traditionally. But what are they eating? So here's from a, a community level. This is estimated need. For a community of 1,000 people, we're looking at about 24,000 fish. But people are only harvesting uh, 6,900 fish. That's about 70% underserved. And I'd mentioned earlier how the distributions of fish are changing. This is projected to affect the availability of fish, reducing it by a further um, 10 to 20 percent. Different types of, sockeye, of, of salmon, sockeye, pink, chum, will be affected. Um, other species will be affected as well. Habitat may increase, um, pink shrimp may increase, but overall the impact will be negative. So what does this mean? What does climate change mean in a very tangible um, number? other than sea level rise in centimeters, or wave impacts, or sediment transport, drift cell changes. Well, for example, if you live in the north end of Vancouver Island, climate change might mean going from seven to six sockeye per person per year in a traditional diet. For the lower mainland, by 2050, that might mean going from seven to five sockeye per person per year. And if you recall the previous speakers showing those, those graphs and those changes in climate impacts, they accelerate after 2050. So by 2100, these impacts will be that much bigger. By 2150, that much bigger again. So what can we do? Climate change is a big global, global process that's affecting these ecosystems and having direct impacts on us. Now I'm short on time, so I'll quickly go over this, um, but to show you a few graphs quickly. Um, this is the mean um, latitudinal change, so the northward shift per decade of a range of species. So you can see the one that's moving uh, the furthest north, the fastest, is Uligan, and halibut are moving the slowest. And we've got, on the scale here, this is tens of kilometers. We've got about 30 or 40 kilometers north per decade for the distribution of Uligan. And for salmon, uh, they're somewhere in the middle. What does this mean? Now we're graphs going the other way. This is changes in catch potential. It means less fish available to catch, less fish to eat. So we have a decrease between you know, 5% and, say, 30% going from um, Pacific sardine. Well, maybe not Pacific sardine. They're increasing a bit. Um, but from clams to Pacific herring. So as these fish move north, as the distributions change, the availability changes as well. And if we look at this final graph um, that explains catch potential by nations in British Columbia, we can see that the Cochimption on the north coast are looking at a minimal decrease in cumulative fisheries catch potential where there's a much greater increase of around 25 to 30% for um, the nations around the lower mainland. So what does this mean uh, for food sovereignty? Let's keep in mind that the projections described here are based on temperature change. They don't take into account habitat loss. They don't take into account phenological mismatch, which is a difference in timing between predator and prey. And they don't take into account pollution or coastal development. Um, as I mentioned, climate change creates these big processes like changes to sea level rise, changes to waves and erosion. But the way we build and develop the coast, the way we armor the coast, the way we manage our ecosystems also plays a big role by affecting, for example, the way sediment shifts. We all have a strong role to play in our own communities to make sure that the way we build and develop the land doesn't exacerbate climate change by increasing erosion and changing the stress on different ecosystems. While one community can do little to affect the global climate, and though we should act and we should work to mitigate climate change, we can do much to affect its impact on the way we live by making sure our environments don't exacerbate these climate changes and erosion. If there's any key messages I'd like to convey from my talk, it's that because of this strong local focus, First Nations and municipalities who both control land use close to the water play a key role in determining climate impacts for a specific place. Climate change impacts are the result of synergistic, a combination of effects,
and have cascading consequences. That means it's not just sea level rise, it's sea level rise in response to the way we build and develop a coast. And climate change will have measurable impacts on First Nations food sovereignty, but these impacts can be mitigated and reduced if we can plan our communities in a way that supports the local ecosystem processes that are important for everyone's way of life. Thank you very much.